is Harry Lewis. Harry Lewis Sr.'s son. That's his, that was his heart. He loved that boy. Well, he was a gym teacher when I was in high school. I graduated in 1993 from Kutso Area Senior High School. Harry Lewis was a track coach at the high school. He was the greatest track coach at the high school. I believe he had something to do with the government. Likeable guy, real nice, and um, he's popular. He was a mentor to me when I was in high school, and he was a very nice person. Um, he is a pillar in the community. Um, he used to be one of the coaches at the high school, and he's one of the representatives uh, for the state of Pennsylvania. He's an awesome dad, awesome grandfather, and he's just an all-around family man. Family means everything to Harry Lewis. What's up, everybody? My name is Vincent Miles Jr. and this is Words of Wisdom. Today, we're at the house of the Honorable Mr. Harry Lewis Jr. When I tell you this man's life is monumental, I mean it's mind-blowing. But you know what? I'm not gonna tell the story. We're gonna go inside of here for ourselves. What's going on, Mr. Lewis? Vincent, how, how are, are you, sir? young man? Wonderful, how wonderful. You welcome, come on in. Oh, man, thank you, thank you. Lewis, good to see you. Yeah, yes. always, always, always. Wow, it's been a couple minutes. It surely has. Last time we spoke, you were down in North Carolina at your, what is it? Your, it's, it's a home, it's another home. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> nice to hear, nice to yeah. hear. So, Mr. Lewis, one thing that we want to know from you is your take on wisdom. When you hear those words, what do you envision and what do you see? Well, I tell you, Vince, wisdom to me means an awful lot. Mm -hmm. But wisdom basically is knowledge and experience. Mm -hmm. And when you combine those two and uh, you can elaborate on a particular topic, through your knowledge mm -hmm. and through your experience with that particular topic that combines and brings wisdom yes. and uh, it brings about uh, attitude, it brings about assurance, mm -hmm. it brings about I know what I'm talking about, right. that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So that's what wisdom is to me, just those two terms. If you have knowledge and you have the experience, mm -hmm. you have wisdom. And so apply those two things in your life, that's when that's what, that's what you do. Yes, it, yes. It's basically a foundation for you. Gotcha. And at least for me, anyway, that's mm -hmm. what it has been for me. Right, right, right. I was born in uh, Queens, Jamaica, New York in 1941. Both of my parents are Southerners. My mother's from Wilkesboro, North Carolina. And my father is from Aiken, South Carolina. And uh, they met in uh, New York City, Queens, New York. Got married and uh, here I am. Dad, uh, you know, guys were moving up, families were moving up from the South to get uh, better jobs. And of course it was during World War II Luke and Steel Company at the time was the number one plate steel co company in the country. So they made all of the uh, steel plates for the uh, ships and uh, the submarines and equipment for those vessels during World War II. They even uh, made uh, the trees, the, uh, I guess, structures that were a part of 9-11. They looked like forks, pieces of material that were left after the destruction of 9-11. Uh, well, my dad was a part of all of that. They built Carver Court so these families would have a place to come and not have to live with other families. 
precious yeah. memories, how they linger. How they linger. Yeah. This brings back a lot of memories. <laughs> Remember the Worthy's house here? Yeah, the Worthy's. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's it, Dee Dee. Now, this is, this is Old Faithful. Yeah. 35. 35. If anything, Mom told us to keep that porch clean. Keep it clean. Oh, my goodness gracious. Yeah, I am uh, Steve uh, Lewis, the fourth oldest in the family. I'm Alice Lewis Eggleston. I'm number four in the lineup of the Lewises. Of course, everybody thinks I'm the oldest because they said I'm bossy and all that, but Harry is the oldest and I'm number four. <laughs> One thing about this place, remember Bud's famous meal? You know, every time we sat around the table, all 10 of us, 11 of us, you know, I don't know if Tam was around yet. Tam but, wasn't around Okay, yet. well, nine of us. Yeah. All Bud want was biscuits and jelly. Biscuits and jelly. That was his favorite. We, we were eating home. syrup. We were eating cereal, yeah. right? Yeah. Want no syrup. Want biscuit and jelly. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. He didn't want nothing but biscuits and biscuits jelly. Biscuits and jelly. That's when Mom made the whole cakes, you know, and uh, we had that, uh, you had the k roll syrup. Mm -hmm. We had the k roll surf, but he wanted the biscuit mm -hmm. mixed with the jelly. Not that the is, white bread. Not the, oh, oh, no, no, no. Are you yeah, kidding? That you was kidding? an insult. What is this? <laughs> there was many a rumble back here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Mom, <laughs> Bud came out of college, and, and, and him and Glenn got the rumbling for supremacy. Oh, yeah. Mom yeah. broke a broom over his back. <laughs> <I said. laughs> Yeah, but I mean, it was it was funny. It was it was, it was fun, funny. Yes. It was yes. funny. This is one of the houses I grew up in right here, number forty six. But that's a whole nother story. And then right across the street over here. Yeah. You remember that? Mm -hmm. Oh yes, we, I do. We spent many a times back here. We had a lot of parties here, didn't we? And, bar and, and BBQs. And bar yeah. <laughs> Barbecues, okay. Yeah. 46, pig roast. Yeah. 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 So, and this is 46, so that makes five. He lived in five. Just like I said, I believe he lived in more houses at Carver's Court than anybody. <laughs> This is the, the, the dedicated sign to honor this village of Carver Court or Foundry Street, whichever you want to say. And uh, the gentleman, Louis Kahn, George Howe, and uh, Oscar Stono, Stona Roth built these buildings, and it was primarily for the minority men that worked at Lucan Steel Company. And uh, during that wartime and uh, people were influxing, making good money, better than they've ever made before, they designed this for them. It's the first uh, village, I like to call it village, but it's the first place that blacks had in Coatesville indoor toilet facilities. And thus, when I was in office as a state representative, we wanted to dedicate this community and let people know how historically valuable this entire, as I say again, village, because it helped raise me, all of my brothers and sisters, and anyone that grew out here, the Joes, the uh, Robinsons, uh, I can name a lot of names that uh, grew up out here and uh, grew up and went to do bigger and better things. But this is the facility. This is the place. This is the foundation. My name is uh, Anthony Lewis. I'm uh, the brother of Harry Lewis Jr. Um, I like to start off by saying uh, that he is an awesome brother. One thing that I really, really, really remember is that when he went off to college, 
uh, left a big hole in the family because he was the eldest. Uh, a lot of things growing up uh, that were transpiring, things that were going on that he would normally handle. <clears throat> and uh, uh, always handled it very well. And again, we were real young. I mean, we were like, <clears throat> when it first started off and my mother started having kids, it was like two years apart with each member of the family. And then it got down to one year. So we sort of laugh about it as siblings. And uh, so we were all close in age. Uh, uh, it, was, it was quite interesting uh, because we were so similar, the younger ones were. And uh, Harry was out doing his thing, uh, trying to accomplish and get himself set up while the other ones, we were just back going to school, trying to do what we were you know, supposed to do as young kids. Okay, my name is Audrey Woodward. I'm named after my mother. I'm the fourth, I'm the third child in the family, the oldest sister. Now, my thing with my oldest brother, Harry, is I had a hard time with him when I was growing up because I was the first girl. And going out on dates was whew, uh, challenging. Because for him, he was a protector and a second father. Now, we had a father, but he had to be a protector slash father to all of us, so he thought. But anyway, um, looking back at it now, I appreciate it. But growing up, I didn't because I was mad at him half the time because going out on dates was a no-no for him. And every time he wanted to go somewhere, he had to ask mom. We either mom asked him, is it safe for them to go to such and such a place? And if he said no, we didn't go. And even though he was the oldest, my mother didn't take no prisoners because she didn't care how old you were. If you did wrong, she going to take something close to her and knock you upside the head. And he was one of them. And then that's a whole nother story, going to college. Tell me about you it. Back, you get back to uh, the wisdom. You get back to the knowledge. Yes. And when I say knowledge, I include education into that also. Mm -hmm. And then your experiences. Yes. I've had experiences when I was in North Carolina and Winston-Salem that I would have never, ever been privy to had I, had I not gone to an HBCU. Mm -hmm. And you learn so much. And when I was there, you know, you meet new people, you meet blacks from uh, all over the country, primarily on the East Coast. Uh, I was on the track team with a myriad of guys, guys from Michigan, yes, uh, Massachusetts, uh, Washington, D.C. especially. Yes. Uh, had the opportunity to uh, uh, mentor, because I was a senior, Earl of Pearl, I know everybody knows that name. Earl of Pearl Monroe? Oh yeah. Yes sir. Yeah, I was his his uh, college mentor. I had to take care of it, make sure nothing happened to him. So he was under your wing? Oh yes. Oh, oh yeah. wow, that's oh, yeah. decent. Yeah. That's really decent. Also, uh, Ted Blunt. I don't know if you know Ted Sounds Blunt. Sounds very familiar. Ted Blunt and uh, Earl of Pearl were, were basketball men. Yes sir. And at the time, Ted Blunt was so good. If you could see him play, he could handle the ball better than Earl the Pearl. The only difference was the Pearl was a shooter. Mm. But Ted was so good with the ball, the Globetrotters wanted him out of college to come with that. From Winston-Salem? From Winston-Salem. Well, wow. Big House game, Games, Games, Games was uh -huh. the uh, epitome at that time of Winston-Salem. And I mentioned Pop Ransom earlier. Well, he was my Pop Ransom at college. Okay. Okay? Mm -hmm. He greeted me at the train station and this type of stuff. And uh, he was a football coach mm -hmm. and uh, the basketball coach. He was Earl of Pearl's coach and mm -hmm. all those guys. With the and he was one of the winningest coaches in, in, in uh, basketball. In, wow. Uh, NCAA, NAIA, that kind of thing. Yeah. So, of course, now he's one of the winningest coaches at the Basketball Hall of Fame. 
Excellent. But yeah. So, uh, very, very famous guy. But mm-hmm. what was unique about Coach Gaines, he was very to the point. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and like you say, you meet a man of that stature and, and you go to him. He, he was hard, but he was fair, mm-hmm. you know? And uh, you get excited and he was excited to be around him and you paid attention. But what I did, I listened to these men and I watched and I observed. I watched their actions, I watched what they do, uh, I paid attention, uh, how they handled their business as coaches when mm-hmm. we would travel uh, from state to state or university to university. Yes. And you pay attention and that stuck with me. And the reason I bring that up and I bring Pop Ranson up and everybody talks about Harry Lewis and what a great coach he was mm-hmm. and this kind of thing. But it goes back to wisdom, it goes back to uh, knowledge and it goes back to education. Yes. And along with that, I would add uh, observance. Mm-hmm. Because a lot of times I mimic what I experienced through their coaching abilities. Mm-hmm. And uh, not stealing from them, but mimicking what they did. Yes. And it carried right over wow. when I started coaching. Right. And I did it a lot of the same things they did when I was stuck with a problem. I referred back to my college days mm. or what these two men told me. Yes. And uh, they were two positive black males in my life. Hi, my name is Earl Johnson, and I met Harry Lewis in 1967 when I attended Scott Middle School. It was the first year of the conversion and the first year of Cash, which is the new high school in the Coastal area. I met Harry's track coach from Winston-Salem. I met him at one of the final fours, Big House Gaines, legend in the historically black college realm. And I knew about him through Harry. Harry would always talk about Big House. So he was holding court in one of the lobbies. You know, I had a lot of people around. So I went up to him and I said, uh, Mr. Gaines, I said, uh, I'm from Coatesville. And he looked, what? You know Harry Lewis? I said, yeah, I, I know Harry Lewis. Harry's a good friend of mine. You tell Harry to send money. Okay. Wow. This is where my... Uh High school career started. This is the old Coatesville area senior high school called Scott High School. Now it's a middle school. Graduated from this building in 1959. And uh, went on from there to Winston-Salem State University. Finished at Winston-Salem State University in 1963. Went to uh, Westchester County, New York, out of White Plains. Worked up there as a social worker for a couple years. Came back, worked for the Chester County Intermediate Unit, which was called the Chester County School Board at the time. Then in 1967, Begin working for the Coach Lawyer School District. And this building, the one that I graduated from in 1959, this was my first job at the intermediate school, which it was turned into. And uh, this is where I started my teaching career. This is the place. Graduated from here, came back, started working for the district here. Then moved down to the new building, Coach Lawyer Senior High School, and uh, never looked back. Harry Lewis was my 
phys ed teacher. Uh, he was my first African American school teacher. And, you know, to have went through up to the 10th grade and having the first African American teacher was a unique experience. And uh, I met Harry and we became real good friends, student friends. Uh, we just took a liking to each other. So at lunchtime, I would meet him at the gym and we'd shoot some baskets. I would win all the time, you know. Harry was a little chubby guy at that time, you know. So he, he couldn't beat me. My name is uh, Doug Lewis. I am in a family of 11 children. I am the 10th child overall and the eighth boy. So uh, talking about my brother, Harry Lewis, he, uh, he's been like a father to me. Harry was my uh, ninth grade and 10th grade gym teacher and my ninth grade uh, track coach indoor and he is my uh, my role model actually. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Vincent Miles. Uh, I had the opportunity of uh, meeting Mr. Lewis uh, actually prior to uh, being in, co in high school. Uh, he was my brother's track coach and they just so happened to win the state championship in 1977. So uh, when I came to high school, I already had an idea of who he was. I knew about his family. We, uh, his brothers went to church at First Calvary in Coachville. So there was already a relationship built there. And um, he was my track coach when we were in high school. And one thing that stands out uh, being in high school with um, him as my coach was that to get something in life, you have to work for it. There are no handouts. And I remember uh, coming from a large family of, of 14 at the time in, in Coatesville, um, close-knit family, we could not afford name brand sneakers or anything like that. But being on the track team, we had to work in order to prove ourselves in order to earn our shoes. So he gave us a standard that we had to complete. And once I attained the goal that he set in front of us, I was able to get my first pair of burgundy and white Nike track shoes. And I was so proud of those sneakers because I was able to take those shoes and school and I couldn't take but a few steps without looking down at the shoes that I earned um, as a track athlete. Here are three decades of athletes that had the opportunity to run for Mr. Harry Lewis. We are now seated in the old stadium of Scott Field, where many of us had an opportunity to run on cinder tracks. And seated with me are Mr. Trent Baker, Mr. Terry Anderson, Reverend Richard King, Mr. Mike Nelson, Mr. Willie Miles, Mr. Anthony Harkins, and Reverend Timothy Creekmore. We represent the 1970s, 80s, and 90s of track excellence at Coachville High School. Um, I remember an incident <laughs> where, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I remember an incident when we were at, 1993, we were at Lehigh, Lehigh, Uni Lehigh University and it was the indoor meet. And I was running the anchor leg on the four by four. And I didn't see Mr. Lewis, but you could always smell him. Yeah. Cause he had the best cologne ever, right? Yeah. So you could yeah. smell him, right? But you couldn't see him. Mr. Lewis was a person who uh, could see through bull, all right? Yes. Uh, there was many times when, you know, we tried to get out of practice. He would make you do incredible things like, for example, we would run 10 quarters, and I, I was a distance man, so <laughs> I wasn't used to running 10 quarters. It was, wasn't my cup of tea. So all of a sudden, one time I'm coming around the turn, and I heard, pick it up, Trent! <laughs> he had that voice, and he just had that personality where he made things come out of you that you didn't think was in you. You know, we would have all kinds of excuses. 
Mr. Lou, I can't run. I think I'm going into labor. <laughs> he will tell you, put some ice on it. Put some ice on it. Put some ice on it. Get back out on the track. Um, it was big to have um, Mr. Lou call you son. If he called you son, yeah. you made it. Um, and this right here. If you ever got this, yep, that Ooh. hand on it. <laughs> if you ever got this right I'm, here, I'm gonna yep. talk about it. Yep. <laughs> you knew, the hand about. About. You knew <laughs> when, when you got that claw, that big bear claw, and it just would suck the energy out of oh, you. Man. Me and a friend of mine came to school not the right frame of mind. I'm not talking about a mental lapse, but something else we had going on in us. And Mr. Lewis spotted us in the hallway <laughs> and looked at our eyes and said, Creek Murren, I won't say them there, come here. We said, we gotta go, we're gonna be late. He said, I can write your hall passes. And as uh, my friend Tony Harkins mentioned, man, he squeezed and, no, I wasn't Tony, as he squeezed and busted our vein. We love Mr. Lewis. Behind his back, we never called him Bud, but, <laughs> but guess what? That's what we did. We made him lose hair. We won championships for him. We won every track meet that we could for him. And we just love Mr. Lewis. Mr. Lewis is uh, world-renowned, one of a kind special to us and he has a special part in all of our hearts. My name is James Harris. I ran for Mr. Lewis in 1977 on this track. I remember times when he used to tell me to push yourself. At that one point I wasn't I wasn't taking it serious and one day he, he set me down and he talked to me and that was like earth wrenching. He told me that I can do whatever I want to do but you gotta stop playing. And when he told me that, I just took off. And I, I thank Mr. Lewis for that. And ever since that, he, he's, he's my man. He's my man. 77 for life. This is, we won, we were champions. 77. Nobody can take that from us. We earned it. Thank you, Mr. Lewis. I remember an incident uh, when we went to uh, the Penn Relays one year, we was in ninth grade. And he was wearing a watch that had Pennsylvania on it, a watch that he won at the Penn Relays. Only the, uh, the winners get those. And I asked about that. Now, when I asked about that, we were in a vehicle with some friends of mine with, with the other part of the relay teams. And uh, he explained what the watch was and everything else. And he looked at me, he said, don't worry about it. You ain't gonna get one of those. Well, my brother got his in college. I got mine in high school. So uh, it, 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 he knew how to push my buttons to make me work harder for something, whether he knew it or not, but he, he, he knew us pretty well as young kids. And uh, with my teaching career, a lot of these young people I've had either in school or I had their parents. You know, when you're there 41 years, you make those connections. So, you know, I, I, I feel pretty good that they remember who, who I am. But it just reminds me that if they remember you that long ago and that many generations, that you must have had some kind of impact. So I just sit back and relish and kind of smile a little bit, you know? My name is Stephen DeVoe. Um, I'm the pastor of the First Baptist Church of Port Deposit, Maryland. I've uh, been knowing Mr. Harry Lewis for 52 years. I uh, met him in 1970, I think it was 71, um, when I was transferring from Gordon Junior High to Scott Intermediate, where he became my uh, phys ed instructor. Um, really, I don't know why, but he sort of took a liking to me. Uh, when I graduated from high school, um, Harry Lowe, I told Harry I wanted to go to college, and he made sure that I uh, was able to go to school in Virginia. I didn't have to pay any money. I got a full ride to go to college. So um, Harry Lewis always uh, looked out for me, always invested in me, always been the kind of a mentor that I was proud to have. And even now, as pastor of the First Baptist Church in Fort Deposit, Maryland, he's still uh, supporting me in so many areas, in so many ways. So I really appreciate him. He's a man of integrity, a man that uh, tries to invest in uh, young people who wants to uh, 
go further in life. This used to be my domain. This is the campus of the uh, Coatesville Area Senior High School. That was my office out there, the track portion. And we've had a lot of big track meets there. And I like to brag and say that's my design. They asked me the kind of track I wanted and there it is an eight lane multi-complex. We got big track meets here for the first time in Coatesville back in 1993 when it all started and uh, we never looked back. Coming from the old Scott Field, a dirt track, four lanes, to this magnificent facility here. Hi, my name is Carl Smith. Um, I'm a lifelong resident of Coatesville, and um, I taught in the Coatesville School District for about 36 years. I was a teacher, football coach, and then I found the light and became a track coach. And um, I finished my career in as an assistant principal at Coatesville High School. Mr. Lewis and I, um, he was a teacher at the intermediate high school I went to. When I was in 10th grade, the spring of that year, they had an appreciation trip for those that were involved with student government. And uh, so we went to a place that if you're a local Coast Filling, you've heard about, it was called Willow Grove Park, and that was an amusement park. And we went there and we're all there and everybody's like, oh, you know, we're gonna get on the roller coaster. And I think, I guess Mr. Lou noted, noticed that I was reluctant, didn't want to get on the roller coaster. And uh, so he kind of pulled me aside and took me aside and he said, Carl, he said, uh, you need to go ahead and get on the roller coaster. If you don't, um, you're going to hear from your classmates and you'll, you'll never live it down. And um, so I did. I got on the roller coaster and I got over that fear. and. Uh, you know, that was the beginning of our relationship, not realizing it at the time, but our beginning of our relationship and me trusting him as a, uh, as a teacher, uh, later as a coach, more importantly, as a human being, as a man. Uh, the opportunity to be an assistant coach with Mr. Lewis for 21 years was an amazing life. Hi, my name is Tom Ingram and I met Harry in 1976. So when I got to Coachville, it was as a football coach. And then they told me, well, you can coach another sport. And I said, I'd like to do track. So I got to talk to Harry about it. And he took me under his wing. And I mean, he took me under his wing. Everything that I've been able to do in track goes back to Harry. Uh, but the biggest thing that I got from him was the sense of family and treating the kids, not as kids, but as a person. Because even with teaching at times, you look at the students that you're teaching and there's that teacher voice or parent voice coming through instead of trying to elevate them so they can understand and they don't feel threatened. Lou is a master at that. And it took me a few years to really learn and understand that. The, uh, and try to apply it and use it with the athletes I was coaching. For 25 years, we were together coaching track, and then he retired. Carl became the head coach, and Lou talked to me about it because uh, Carl got the job, I didn't. And he said, you gotta stay. 
And he was right. I couldn't really see it at the time, but he was right. So I have been at Coatesville Coaching Track since 1977. And as I said, I owe it all to Harry and his treatment of me, his advice, the way he treated his athletes, as people. And if they had a family problem, it was the family problem that they had to solve. He would help them with it, didn't have to come to practice, take care of the family. So that's, I think, his words of wisdom. Take care of the family. Take care of the people that you are surrounded with, and they will take care of you. Stephanie Lewis. I am the oldest of Harry's daughters and growing up as the oldest of Harry's daughter, uh, I can say that the one thing I want the world to know about my father is how extremely generous he is. Um, there are 15 years between me and my sister and so I had dad to myself to my junior year in high school and he was the best father ever. We lived in Carver's Court, meager, meager surroundings, but full of love. I never missed anything. One of my Christmas presents was he bought me a car. And even though I, going back and forth to college for three years, I knew my way to North Carolina with my eyes closed. Um, but him and my mom spent the entire Christmas break lecturing me about speeding and obeying the traffic laws and whatever. So um, I remember I pack up, my mom's crying, I get in the car and I'm just happy to go. And dad says, oh hey honey, call us when you get there. So I'm driving and I'm on 95 in Maryland and I notice as I'm switching lanes, there's a car that looks like my dad's, not too far behind me. No big deal, I go a little bit more. And I notice every time I'm switching the lane, the same car switching the lane. Probably by the time I got to Virginia, I realized it was my dad. And I pull over, I'm like, Daddy, what are you doing? And he had tears in his eyes. He said, baby, I just had to make sure you got there safely. And uh, I, <laughs> I still get emotional thinking about it. That's, that's who Harry Lewis is. And um, I couldn't have prayed for a better father. Um, I love that man, I do. He is, uh, when my mother passed away, he became dad and mom. So we've gotten to know each other through different chapters uh, in my life. And now that I'm a parent and my son who is 26 does those, <laughs> Those things that drive parents crazy. My dad just laughed. He said, now you remember what you put me through. But he's there to give me counsel and wisdom. And I can call my dad now at five o'clock in the morning. And I said, daddy, you sleep? And he'll say, baby, I got you, what you need? And that is such a blessing. And I thank you for your time and for listening to me. Harry Lewis Jr. is an awesome man. And I am so very grateful to God to call him my father. And this is Miss Thang. Miss Thang. Hi. Right. Hi, my name's Bridget Lewis Boyer. I am the daughter, the youngest daughter of Harry Lewis Jr. So much I could say about him. Growing up was a joy. Like I can legit say I had a great childhood. Um, to me, I feel like my dad is 
the prototype of what a man and what a father should be. I feel like he needs to write a book on how to be a good dad, how to be a good parent. I'm so thankful that I had such a wonderful experience, you know, with my dad. I can honestly say that he's my best friend. Like, we're like way too close. Like, no joke, me and him talk probably five to eight times every single day. We went through a very, very tough time together and a lot of people don't know that about my dad. My mom and dad were married for 35 years before my mom passed away. So I was 14 and like I said, my parents were married for 35 years. So my mom was the go-to for everything and my dad was always a track or, you know, shooting at the gun club or things like that. So when we lost my mom in 1998, he had to take on the role of mother and father. So it's a role that he just fell into. Like we sort of learn our new life together, like little things from how to wash clothes at a grocery shop. I'm 14 trying to figure it out. Like we would pull up at Acme, he'd give me cash or the credit card, like go do your thing. So I'm in there grocery shop, like, okay, learning how to cook, just remembering things that my mom taught me, you know, us grieving together and seeing, you know, the strength in him, dealing with that together was just made our bond unbreakable. So being home with us grieving, but still seeing him getting up, going to work at this high school every day. He was at the high school, I was in ninth grade. I'm like, this dude is like, a machine like you know of course he grieved but he never stopped he never gave up he just always pushed through and him being strong is what made me be strong and us going through that together just made us inseparable so that was definitely a turning point in our life because that is something that we could not have anticipated not have prepared for but it's something that we got through so it was just us my sister and I are 15 years apart so she was already married with a child and living in Harrisburg so it's just me and him in here figuring out life so that was like our really that was definitely the turning point for our bond um, about I'm 27 about 14 years ago we were fishing on his lake, uh, well, off his dock at his lake house. And I'm um, using one of his old rods and uh, I know what it meant to him. Um, I was only 14, 15, so I wasn't really taking it seriously as I needed to. And the rod ended up in the lake. Um, you know, I knew it was his possession and what he means to me, I know that rod meant to him. So I followed the rod into the lake and couldn't swim. Um, almost drowned for it, but I could see how happy he was after I told him what had happened. I never got the rod back, by the way, but he was just so, uh, so happy that I even tried to do that. Um, and you know, I've tried to take that same, uh, you know, approach into my regular life. You know, he's just, just as selfless as I was in that moment. He has been every moment of his life. Um, and that's been very inspiring. <clears throat> I am Nikki Fleming. I'm the bonus baby and sister to Bridget and Stephanie. Um, Pop-Up's my bonus dad. And what's special about him is the fact that he shows such humility and he's genuinely giving to not only his family but the community. I think that's what especially touched me when I first met him. Not only to me, but my children as well, his grandchildren. So um, I think I'm especially thankful to have someone who is such a great role model to my children and to me personally. Uh, I'm DJ, I'm Mr. Lou's grandson. One of the best things I, when I think about him is how he has touched so many people's lives and impacted so many people and how proud it makes me. I remember countless times when we would be driving in his car through Coatesville and just people seeing him, noticing him, recognizing him, just going up to talk to him. And I felt, even at such a young age, just so much pride and amazement. Been like, oh my gosh, who is my grandfather? Like, who is this guy they're all talking to? And Hi, my name's Amari Boyer and I'm Harry Lucy's granddaughter. And I'm really so thankful that I could call him my grandfather in my life because he means so much to me. 
And we were always, it was always us. Like, we was always so close. That was always my guy. I was always his girl. Like, we was really, it was always us. And one thing he really loves about me, like, that I love that we had together is our bond. Our bond and, like, the way he's always at my practices. Like, he's never too busy for me or, like, he just, he loves his family so much. Father's been through a lot. Even now, um, I'm still learning a lot about my father. He's shared the story, and I didn't find this out till maybe five years ago, that he and my mother both went to Winston-Salem State University, and um, those were the lunch counter sit-in times. And um, my mother was protesting, and um, a I believe it was a Ku Klux Klan member or someone protest protesting against blacks um, urinated on my mom. And when my mom told my dad, he's a member of the Kappa Alpha Psi fraternity, it was they were planning the biggest <laughs> revenge, as you can imagine, like one of the most despicable acts you could do to another human being. And this happened to his girlfriend at the time. So um, he tells a story of how Dr. Martin Luther King just happened to be in, in Greensboro and heard about this horrific act. And, and, and he calmed my dad and his Dr. Friend. King came that close <laughs> to saying or speaking out of his religion. Yeah. That's how mad he was. Wow. And his exact words that I remember verbatim. He pointed his finger, you young men are getting ready to derail this movement. I never will forget those words. And uh, he only talked to us for about 10, 15 minutes. Wow. And it flipped all of us like that. Immediately. And, right. And then I found out that Dr. King was a Republican. That's how I became a Republican. Mr. Lewis, when he was running for state representative in the 74th district, I was um, a local resident in a close nearby neighborhood or town out in Westchester. And um, I was always impressed by the way Mr. Lewis carried himself, the way he treated others, and most importantly, how he, uh, he lit up the room wherever he went. And I remember campaigning and uh, for Mr. Lewis and really being in encouraged uh, throughout the way because he didn't just care about himself, he cared about myself, he cared about others. He was really um, a leader, he, a mentor to anyone that, that we walked in his path. I'm Trish Melanies and I've known Harry for a long time. I actually got more closer to him when he ran for state rep. Um, he came into my office, um, my husband had had him for a school teacher and unfortunately my husband passed away and he's the one that sort of promoted Harry into running for state rep. So Harry came to me and said the only way he would run for state rep is if I'd be his campaign manager. Um, he was the easiest candidate you could ever have because everywhere we went, everybody knew Mr. Lewis. Hi, my name is Amber Little Turner. I uh, first met Mr. Lewis I would say about 10 years ago. Um, actually, I met Mr. Lewis through his wife, Miss Regina. Um, I had lunch with her one time and she was telling me about her husband and how he's met towards so many different people and she was surprised that I didn't know him. So of course, she set up a date for us to meet. Um, I then continued to build our own our relationship and had a chance to uh, work with him through his campaign for state representative, uh, volunteered on his campaign. And then once he won, uh, of course, which was a historic moment in our history here in Chester County. Uh, he, he serving as the first African American in the state legislature, which was pretty awesome. So I had a chance to work with him in his legislative district office in Downingtown, Pennsylvania. Uh, and just through my experience of, of um, working with him and kind of being mentored by him from a professional standpoint, uh, I wouldn't be where I am today, which is amazing. My name is Regina Lewis. I met Mr. Lewis back in 1995 and I, the very first time that I came to Coatesville, I really came here to work in the community 
And as I was going through the community, different people would say to me, if you're going to do anything good in this community, especially in relation to young people, you have to meet Mr. Harry Lewis. I would hear that over and over and over again. And as it was, I was in a meeting and I was actually facilitating a meeting and there was a very long conference table and Mr. Lewis had come in a little later than everyone else and I didn't know who he was. And he had sat at the very other end of the room and people were arguing. They were absolutely arguing and I was trying desperately to handle this meeting and get people to come to a resolution as to what we were going to do that particular summer. And as people were trying to volley for position, because there was actually money involved in this, we were going to put a lot of money into the community, and everybody had their own ideas as to how this money should be spent for the youth during the summer months. And somebody said, as all of this was going on, and I was getting very nervous, someone said, well, what does Mr. Lewis think? And that's the first time I had an indication that Mr. Lewis was in the room. And it was like the commercial Merle Lynch speaks or something like, I mean, there was a hush over the room when that statement was made. And every head turned toward Mr. Lewis. And Mr. Lewis said what he had to say. And I remember his words and he, I remember him saying, for the good of the young people in this community, this is what we should do. And everybody looked at each other and said, well, if that's what Mr. Lewis thinks, then that's what we should do. And I thought I was just jolted into why people were telling me you have to talk to Mr. Lewis because everybody had such a respect for his input. And that was my first introduction to Mr. Lewis. As things went along, I actually hired Mr. Lewis to run one of our summer programs. And then he hired other people, young people and experienced people. Dr. Bailey was one that worked with him on our program. And he hired um, Billy Miller, and a bunch of guys to work with him on this program for the young people. And it went very well. I couldn't have asked for more. And I tease him about it. And I tell him that I used to be his boss. And then I became his boss when I married him about five years later. A lot of people told me stories where they thought that Mr. Lewis saw things in them that they didn't see in themselves. That they didn't know they had the strength to come through certain things or they didn't know they had the talent that they could do things, or they didn't know they had the talent to go to college. But Mr. Lewis would say, oh yeah, you're going to college. <laughs> There's no doubt. And he would make a way for them to go. One young man, I remember, he graduated. He didn't have a family that could go to the graduation, and it was down south somewhere, and no one could go. And Mr. Lewis, he got in the car, drove down for that young man's graduation. He never forgot that. He made sure that that young man had a job every summer when he would come home from school. He made sure he had money in his pocket, he had clothes on his back, and that he had the things that he needed. But most of all, he gave a lot of people a lot of hope. And uh, he would take his shirt off of his back, no doubt. Uh, he would come home and say to me, this is going on with a young person at school. They need help. Their mother just got out of jail. He won't come to school because he doesn't have clean clothes. He said, we got to get them a washer and dryer. That his mother has to be able to wash and dry for her five children so these kids can come to school. The wisdom that I saw him live out day in and day out had an impact on me and um, even in the uh, tragic loss of his first wife, uh, just watching how he walked through that and uh, how people that came alongside of him uh, just had the utmost, you saw the utmost respect and outpouring of love for him. And it was hard when he lost his first wife. They had been married for 30 some years. 
and she suddenly passed away. Um, so when I came into his life, he was in a lull, I would say. He was a bit confused because he had lost the love of his life. And I remember when we went out on dates, probably about the fifth or so date, I asked him, I didn't know his wife, so I said to him, I said, if you don't mind, and if it wouldn't be too painful, would you tell me about your wife? Well, my husband lit up like a candle. He told me all about how he had met his wife in college, how they had fallen in love, how they had Stephanie first. She was 15 years ahead of Bridget, how they had bought this house, um, how they had made a life for themselves. And I was so impressed with what he was telling me. And in all relationships, you have the good and the bad. And I believe he told me both. But I knew he loved his wife and he took good care of her. And I knew that he was a sincere person. Uh, Every day you're blaming it on me. I, <laughs> yeah, I think it was a Hershey or Rocky Springs. Rocky Springs. Yeah, <laughs> I think my legacy here is uh, my longevity, my involvement almost in every aspect with uh, the students that went through here, uh, my 41 years here, uh, each class uh, talked about the other class and what we did, what we accomplished. We did jobs for young people during the summers. Uh, we were involved in various aspects of their lives and programs that we had for uh, the youngsters here at Coatesville. Uh, I think uh, my participation and being an, a board member at the Brandywine, the old Brandywine Health Foundation, and they thought it was worthy enough that they created a scholarship in my name $20,000 scholarship to one of our uh, seniors, $5,000 a year, of course, for four years. Uh, it was endowed and uh, those kinds of things that uh, contributed in my name. Uh, educator of the year, as you saw some plaques here, that's, to me, that, that's awesome for a phys ed teacher. And uh, then went into administration and then for one year, uh, a principal, I mean, that was an end in my career, and to have that on my resume as being a principal, at least for one year, was very, very significant. So all of those things added up, and uh, that's kind of where we are. Who is Harry Lewis? Mr. Lewis is definitely a living legend. The best memory that I have of Mr. Lewis is walking down the streets of Coatesville with him and I literally witnessed a grown man cry in his presence because of the impact that he's had in their lives. She said to him, Harry, you take care of your brothers. And he's done that. And so for that, you know, he's just been blessed. The epitome of greatness to me. Not because he's my dad, but because I've seen him in so many different situations that he stood up where a lot of people would have folded, so. Harry Lewis Jr. is an awesome man, and I am so very grateful to God to call him my father. He is a quality man, period. <laughs>